and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. So today is a monumental day because Kelsey and I are recording in the same room for the first time. Oh, what is happening? It's so weird to look at your face while I'm talking to you. I know, you. you're just not a little mini thing on my corner. Yeah, I know. It's like a real thing. I have to confront you in the flesh. And so <laughs> uh, today's going to be very different and exciting and fun. I've been up here in Kelsey's neck of the woods for Kelsey's bachelorette party. Oh, yeah. So if my voice cracks or sounds in any way weird, it's because we just were having too much fun this weekend. I agree. That's the same thing about my voice. But anyhow, I did want to talk today before we get started about kind of my struggle with being a feminist and then also giving maybe an unfavorable opinion to someone someone else's work. You know, as we're doing an opinion podcast here, obviously we're not always going to love it. We've already not loved it. And it's funny because I wrote this in our notes that this was something I wanted to talk about for today's podcast. And it's like particularly apt because this is the first episode where Kelsey and I have very, very differing opinions about something. And then, of course, we're also sitting in the same room, so I have to look at her when I tell her that I disagree. Um, <laughs> it's but- okay, though, because in all honesty, that's what makes for an interesting discussion when you have two separate points of view. And so that's what they are, two separate points of view. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I just want to say, though, that I feel like even if I don't love someone's book, I personally, and I think you do too, like I respect the fact that they sat down and wrote you know, 300 pages of whatever was on their mind. You know, I'm not sitting here saying that I could do the same thing, but you know, I have an opinion. I have lots of opinions. (laughs) That's okay. Yeah. So we're going to be given lots of those today. But anyhow, let's soldier on. Before we jump into the book that we read, I have a question for you, Kelsey. All right. I'm waiting to hear it. So why do you feel like you love these books, particularly historical romance novels? Like what in your history, in your life prepped you for for this genre or what moments stand out from your past? So for me, I history has always been one of my favorite subjects. I love delving into the past. I love looking at how people lived. I love looking at how culture changed. I love all of it. And I loved historical fiction as a kid. And I think that for a long time, that was my favorite genre of books. And then I kind of delved in some other books as I got older, just reading young adult fiction, things like that. But historical romance or historical fiction, I should say, was always my favorite. So then it was just kind of a natural progression because I always loved a good love story. It's why I liked young adult novels because it was like coming of age. But also, too, there was always a boy meets girl or sometimes (laughs) a boy meets boy, you know, or a girl meets girl. But I just loved the story of how people meet and how they interact and how they learn to like have a life together. And I've always really loved that. So for me, historical romance was just very much a combination of my love of historical fiction and historical facts meshed with my love of a good love story. That is so sweet. And I can totally relate. I would say very similar things, except my kind of gateway was fantasy. My dad was- I read a lot of those too. (laughs) So my dad was a huge fantasy reader, and so he would give me these fantasy books. And and absolutely, my favorite part of a fantasy book was when two characters, like, had this tension or fell in love. And like we've said before, I didn't know about historical romance till my 20s when Kelsey uh, introduced it to me. But I was really thinking about, like, these three kind of moments of my past that I have absolutely always identified with, and it actually has three different songs. Oh. So the first song is from Beauty and the Beast. I'm a huge Beauty and the Beast fan. <laughs> if <laughs> What? I, no way. <laughs> I know. If anybody heard our trailer and didn't figure out that that was the bookshop scene from Beauty and the Beast, that's what that was. <laughs> uh, I couldn't resist. So in that same song, there's another stanza where she says, Ah, isn't this amazing? It's my favorite part because you'll see. Here's where she meets Prince Charming, but she won't discover that it's him till chapter three. And I feel like that... I just, I just got super goosebumps just now, <laughs> Zoe, because I... Like, I'm not quite as big of a Beauty and the Beast fan as you, but that's, like, my favorite thing. And when I'm thinking of the song, like, I sing that stanza all the time. It's so... <laughs> I just... Yeah, you're... Okay, you guys missed it, but Kelsey's face was just 
just the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I love it. Yeah, it was so good. So that's like my childhood. And I feel like I always, that and also, of course, like the, I want adventure in the great white somewhere, you know, and that song. Oh, it's just, it so invokes this like romantic, like I want more and I'm going to fall in love. And so there's that. And then my teen years, I was super enamored with a play called The Scarlet Pimpernel. You've told me about this. Yeah, they have great songs. And my favorite song is called Storybook. I don't love the instrumentation of it so much, but the lyrics are so great. And so at least one of the stanzas, there's a few different stanzas, and I recommend you guys look it up and listen to it. The The, the main line that I love so much from it is, Ah, but my prince, if you can't be as sweet as you seem, I'd rather dream. Come and wake me. Come be the love I can hold now. Storybook love leaves me cold now. Show me the way to stop dreaming. There is only one perfect storybook ending. That is the end of pretending. That is the moment I say, love me now. Oh, I love singing on this scratchy voice. I know. Isn't it great? <laughs> oh, my God. I feel like, hi, everybody. I'm super great at this. It's okay. My words are coming a little slow today. Yeah. <laughs> so that one. And then finally, the song of my adult life that I just totally think about is, uh, surprise, surprise, Hamilton. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Huge Hamilton over here. But it's from Take a Break. And Angelica is saying to Hamilton, the letter I received from you two weeks ago, I noticed a comma in the middle of a phrase. It changed the meaning. Did you intend this? One stroke and you've consumed my waking days. It says, my dearest Angelica. With a comma after dearest, you've written my dearest Angelica. Anyway, all this to say. Anyhow, <laughs> I just like every time that I hear things like that, those are the things that I take away. And I think that the moment that I read a good historical romance novel, all of the feelings that those songs bring out in me, the excitement, the happiness, the joy, the anticipation, that's what these historical romance bring for me. It is. But that's why we all love a love story, because everyone has their own version of a love story. And everyone can enjoy a love story. You know, I know maybe you don't like a rom-com. Like, there are people in the world who don't. But you know, <laughs> you know why there's so many rom-coms? is because people like rom-coms. Mm -hmm. They are fun and sweet. And these books are book candy for me. And I just love them. Agreed. So, shall we get to the book that we are talking about today? Yes. So the book we're talking about today is the romance novel that popped my romance cherry. And it was given to me by a friend of mine from high school, and she gave it to me because she said her mom was reading it and couldn't stop laughing during it. So she gave it a shot, enjoyed it, handed it off to me, said, I hope you like it. And that is what started the whole thing. So today we're reading Sleepless at Midnight by Jackie D'Alessandro. It's the first book in the Mayhem in Mayfair series that she wrote. Yeah, and our main characters are Miss Sarah Morehouse and Matthew Devonport, the Marquess of Langston. Jackie de Alessandro, um, she's not got a big presence online. She doesn't really have her own website, nothing of the sort. Yeah, in fact, her last book was published five years ago under that name. So unless she's publishing under a different name, she hasn't been very active at all. Yes. So she grew up on Long Island. Long Island. <laughs> I uh, have spent a bit of time on Long Island. I went to school there very briefly. So that's fun. And she says she was drawn to romance because she always wanted to be swept off her feet by a rogue on a stallion. Sounds great to me, too. That's actually in her bio, though. So that's where <laughs> I took that from. Yeah. So I found a interview from 2000-ish, which is 20 years ago. If you think about it, it's basically 20 years ago. That's crazy. That is crazy. And a lot has changed in the last 20 years. So 
that is part to remember. But anyhow, I did find this little excerpt from this interview that had been on a GeoCities website, and it said so on the banner up top, like, here we go, MySpace, GeoCities, blast from the past. But it was like, <laughs> this is mirrored from a two, from a GeoCities website. But anyhow, there was a small interview that she did, and I just thought, uh, Kelsey, would you like to do a scene? I will happily role play with you. Excellent. So you're going to be Donna, the interviewer, and I'm going to be Jackie D'Alessandro, if that's okay. That's fine. And, and I just want to preface saying that within this interview, she did say a lot of things in a specific accent. It was written with the emphasis uh, in parentheses next to everything that she said. So therefore, I'm going to <coughs> do my best to do this accent. All right. I'm ready. And see. What are some of your favorite websites and discussion boards? I've only been to two boards, here at RBL and the board at the Romance Journal. I enjoy both sites, especially now that I've figured out how to work the quote, click here to reply thingamabob. I also like the Romance Reader site. I love Amazon.com. I'm always plopping something in my shopping cart. I get a package from them about once a week. And I just discovered buy.com. They have the best prices on everything. We bought ourselves a new camera for Christmas. I'm sorry, but 20 years ago, she just discovered Amazon.com and get something from them once a week. I think I get something from them about twice a day. I'm so I know. Mad. Oh, God. It's the worst. And I I need things for work. And it's like I could just cop down to the store. And I'm like, let's see if Amazon have it has it. It's fine. We buy 90 90- five percent of our stuff online not just from amazon we, we order from target we order from chewy we order from amazon uh, of course i do love to support local businesses don't get me wrong but like if i'm buying my toilet paper like i don't ever want to set foot in a target again so <laughs> um john's the same way when we need things like cleaning supplies or toilet paper paper towels things that we're just gonna buy at big grocery stores anyway we're not buying those locally we're buying those from a chain and he's like great amazon will just bring it to us Yes. So I am all about the shipping to my house because it is such a time saver. It is. It really is. It's how we got all our podcasting equipment. Hey, and how you got it to me because I we do. don't live in the same town. I know. It was there two days later. Okay. So plot time? Uh, No. I've got some fun historical facts for you before we dive in today. Oh, uh, hell yeah. I've actually got two. One because I found it and it was just so weird that I had to include it. And then the other one actually is relevant to what we're reading today. Cool. So our first historical fact of the day is apparently Parmesan cheese was a very popular Regency ice cream flavor. And this is according to The Guardian. So I am not upset by that. (laughs) I like that they were already experimenting with weird flavors because we're like, ooh, what's a weird flavor you can experiment with? Yeah, I love cheesecake. So like, I feel like that could maybe taste like cheesecake. Oh, I never even thought of it that way. Just like a slightly sharper cheesecake. Yeah. Oh. I have this cheesecake cookbook and it like talks about making cheesecakes with all these different types of cheese. And I'm just like, I really love like the cheesecake that I have quote unquote perfected (laughs) for my tastes. So I keep going like, do I dare? Do I dare try it with like these other cheeses? But it's just like, it's hard. Anyhow, it's hard. <laughs> so now relevant, this isn't a spoiler. We're going to get to it in about two seconds as we get into the plot. Our main character, Sarah, has formed a book club with her friends. And the first book of the book club they're reading is Frankenstein, which just came out. And Mary Shelley wrote it. And they talk about how it was scandalous for them to be reading it because Mary Shelley had a scandalous life. So I wanted to look into the scandalous life to see if the facts they stated in the book were true. And I kind of stumbled into this other cool fact that I didn't even know was that Mary Shelley was actually born Mary Wollstonecraft. And I was like, I know that name. They're like, her mother was Mary Wollstonecraft. Turns out her mother was the Mary Wollstonecraft who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792, in which she argues, this is taken from Wikipedia, but I'm just going to tell you this right now, in which she argues that women are not naturally inferior to men, but appear to be only because they lack education. She suggests that both men and women should be treated as rational beings and imagines a social order founded on reason. And also, too, she led a very scandalous life, which is actually why she rung a bell as someone. I was like, she did something famous. And I'm pretty (laughs) sure she was also a scandalous person in her own right, which is why it makes sense that Mary Shelley was perfectly fine living a scandalous life with Percy because her mother had her own equally scandalous life. Very, very cool. Yeah, it makes me want to delve into that a little bit deeper and learn more. I'm super interested. I always think that 
you know, badass feminists from times when it was not even a thing are just incredible to read about and inspiring. Absolutely. I would actually love to read A Vindication of the Rights of Women, but I have a very hard time reading um, writing from that period of time. Yeah, I, I can understand that. But I bet there's some sort of modern yeah. uh, interpretation. I'm not going to lie. I actually did read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and I didn't actually finish it because I was <gasps> like, DNF. I didn't finish it because it was really hard for me to read it. And it was one of those things where I'd start reading it and I'd get like, I get into it and I get into it. And then I'd put it down and like forget about it. I just have a hard time writing. But it's the same reason I can't read Jane Austen. Yeah. So I have almost read Sense and Sensibility through to the end about a billion times. It's like literally the one of the most incredible movies. It's one of the most beautiful stories. And when I read the book every time, it's been years actually since I picked it up, but it's so beautiful, but her sentences are very long. And also it is, it's harder to follow right, with my modern brain. And exactly. It's a shortcoming. And no, it's a fair. I have never finished a Jane Austen novel through and through. The only Pride and Prejudice that I have actually read from cover to cover was a graphic novel. Yeah, there's a graphic novel, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. It's beautiful. I'm sure. And, but they pull the dialogue straight from the book. So you get the same dialogue as in the book, but then it's done in pictures. That was the only version of Pride and Prejudice I've actually read cover to cover. I have not read a single Jane Austen book, and I've tried to read probably three or four of them, and I have not finished any of them. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't read it. I love her stories. I cannot read her writing. Yeah, I think I tried to read Jane Eyre also. That's a Bronte That's a Bronte. Book, but I tried to read it when I was young because my friend read it when she was 10, and I was like, ah, well, if Lori does it, I'm going to do it. And that, I think, was also a bad introduction as a 10-year-old, like, trying to read Oh, Jane, Jane I read that. In, I had to read it in high school. I didn't actually – I would skip sections of it because I wouldn't have done the reading in school, and then we'd discuss it in class, and then I'd be like, well, I'll just pick up at the next section we're reading. I feel like half of our listeners are definitely going to like us a little bit less after I know. They're like, this. how dare you not ever be able to read? <laughs> to be fair, I did finish – Wuthering Heights. I read that book cover to cover, and that is a hard Bronte book. All right, kudos for that. So shall we now get into the plot? We shall now get into the plot. Okay. As we mentioned, our main characters, Miss Sarah Morehouse, physician's daughter, and Matthew Devonport, or Kess Langston. <clears throat> so Sarah Morehouse is attending a house party thrown by the Marquess of Langston. We open to Matthew, who is almost out of time. He is in the rain during a storm digging and he's kind of giving us some information but nothing really substantial yeah it's definitely like it was a dark and stormy night sort of opening <laughs> yes very and he's searching for something late at night and then he senses someone watching him and he sees the village blacksmith walking across his land he's like maybe that's who's watching me and it cuts away it's not very interesting it's it's kind of setting a mood but we don't actually get much concrete information no there's a lot of what is this and what is that and what is this and what is that? Next scene. Next scene. So this is where it gets fun. And this is partly what prompted this. So Sarah Morehouse, her sister Carolyn, who is Lady Wingate, who she was widowed three years ago. And she's also why Sarah was there. She had asked Sarah to attend this party with her. And their friends Lady Julianne Bradley and Lady Emily Stapleford um, are all in Sarah's room for their first meeting of the Ladies Literary Society of London. And the idea with the title is that they're going to be, everyone's going to assume they're discussing Shakespeare, but really, they're going to discuss the scandalous works of the age. Ooh. Their first novel of the club is Modern Prometheus, or as we like to call it, Frankenstein, by Mary Shelley. And through the discussion, they talk about how it's so macabre and how Dr. Frankenstein made this man, but he made him so hideous and he was so afraid of him. It's like, why wouldn't he just try to make the prettiest man he could? <laughs> if I'm going to make something, I want to make a pretty man. And so they end up divulging from Frankenstein's monster and his failed effort to make a man into how they would make their perfect man. A conversation that I'm sure many of us have had in our younger years with our friends. Yes. So they decide on his traits, and then they decide they will each pilfer, um, I mean borrow, um, <laughs> items of clothing from gentlemen in who are at the house party. So they will actually build this man. He's not just a metaphysical man. He's actually going to be a physical man, i.e. he's going to be dressed with like a stuffed pillow head. So according to the Ladies Literary Society of London, the perfect man is a kind, patient, generous, honest, honorable, witty, intelligent, handsome, romantic, stunningly passionate, 
make your insides flutter, full-lipped good kisser who can dance, shop, listen, solicit our good opinions, all tirelessly and without complaint. Oh, and he should wear glasses. I mean, it sounds pretty great. (laughs) Yeah, it does. I mean, it sounds good. So they decide they're going to meet up the following night with all their pilfered objects, and they are going to build the perfect man. And once Sarah bids them all good night, she looks through the window, and what does she see? Matthew Devonport, their host, returning to the house in a storm with a shovel. Hmm, suspicious. Yes. Eerie. (laughs) The next morning, Sarah, who's a morning person, is out. She loves to sketch and she loves flowers, so she decides to explore Matthew's lovely gardens. And while she's out discovering the garden, she finds this little shelter where it has this beautiful fountain of the Greek goddess Flora, and she just loves it. It's so peaceful. And then all of a sudden, this dog comes bounding in, and she's like, hello, friend. How are you? And then... Who walks up behind the dog? But her host, who was out in the rain last night, and who's also up at the crack of dawn for some reason. Yeah, and she also has a similarly large dog, uh, who she has named Desdemona, and this dog is named Danforth. So she loves dogs. She's into big dogs. This is not a thing for her, although Matthew finds it surprising that a lady would have no problem with a large animal like that. Yes. So Matthew kind of saw someone up in the window when he returning home. He was hoping no one had actually seen him, but he realized it was Sarah when he sees her this morning. And he does have this little funny account of how he saw her at dinner the night before, and he just remembered she was Lady Wingate's sister. And he had a little chuckle because she was going to eat some soup. And as she smelled the soup and was about to take it, her glasses fogged up because Sarah wears glasses. And her glasses fogged up. And he just thought it was funny because he remembered all the times that had happened to him. Yes. But of course, Sarah did not take that it that way. She had said, oh, he's laughing at me and then kind of, you know, shrugs it off. Yes. So they're kind of at odds with each other from the beginning. They're a little suspicious of the other one, not quite on the same page. But they end up having a rather nice discussion while they're out in the garden. And he learns about flowers. And they actually kind of part ways. And he's a little bit intrigued by Sarah after this meeting. Yeah. So they they start talking and he kind of like can't believe that he's talking to this bespectacled, spinsterish, plain woman. And yet she has some interesting conversation and she has a lot of horticultural knowledge. In fact, she even at some point shows her sketchbook to him and he is blown away by her sketches because she's really good and he's flipping through the pages and what should he see but a very good sketch of a very handsome, very naked man. Ooh, so he's already a little intrigued by Sarah. He's like, why does this spinster have a naked man in her sketchbook? And Sarah has given this man a name, but She added the name just last night because she named him the same name that they named their perfect man, which was Franklin N. Stein. So this sketch actually was a sketch of a statue that she had seen at someone's house, yada, yada, yada. That's not important. But immediately, Matthew believes that Sarah is not all she seems. Who is this Franklin? Is it her lover? He doesn't accuse her of anything, but he is quite taken aback. Yes, and it sticks with him. So they part ways. Matthew goes into the house, and he talks with his friend Daniel, who is Lord Sutton. And he was like, hey, can you go into the village? Because I saw the blacksmith crossing my land last night, and it was really weird. And I got this feeling of being watched. So can you just, like, ask some questions and seeing? Because Matthew doesn't go to the village. Nope. We don't know why. He just doesn't go to the village. He hasn't been to the village in, like, 20 years. So his friend is like, yeah, sure, I'll go to the village, check out what you're looking for. And in this conversation, we also learned that Matthew needs money, so he needs to marry an heiress because his estate is poor. His dad recently died in the last year and left a lot of debts. So Matthew's trying to bring the estate back together. And Sarah had heard rumors that he was looking for a bride, and he had invited her sister and two friends who were all basically likely heiress candidates. Little does he know that two of them are actually not really viable options. One is not interested in marriage and one's family financials have gone in a downward direction, although it's not publicly known yet. So really he has done a bad job inviting people to his house. Yeah, he really has. But yeah, so they have dinner and then later on Sarah is out to retrieve her item for the perfect man scavenger hunt oh my and she was assigned to get a shirt 
from Lord Langston. And so after dinner, she sneaks away because she all the women have retired. All the men are supposed to be like drinking port and discussing things in the billiards room or whatever. And so she sneaks into Lord Langston's room and she finds the shirt pretty easily. That's not a problem. And then all of a sudden she hears the door open. And who should be walking in but Matthew, ready to take a bath. And so she doesn't realize he's taking a bath just now. So she hides very quickly because she hears his voice and she's in his dressing room. So she hides behind a curtain and she's like, that's okay. He's going to be here for two seconds and then he's going to leave. It's going to be fine. And no, he's not leaving. He's taking a bath. He <laughs> sure is. And so little Miss Sarah is peeking behind the curtain. And what should she see but a very handsome naked man over there? Yeah, actually, there are two little quotes from this that I didn't pick out as my favorite quote, but she's talking to herself and she says, avert your eyes this instant and give that poor man the privacy he deserves. What the poor man deserved, Sarah decided, was a standing ovation. <laughs> That's just such a great line. Yeah. And she also says, or thinks, she hadn't believed anything could look more perfect than a naked Lord Langston, but obviously something could. A naked and wet Lord Langston. <laughs> Anywho, so she is hiding behind a curtain and she accidentally like squeaks a floorboard and she's hoping he doesn't act like he's heard it. So she's like, okay, cool. I'm safe. It's all good. And she's like, and he's going to take that towel. He's going to dry off and he's going to put on that robe and he's going to leave. And she's like, okay, he's leaving. He's leaving. Takes a deep breath. And what should happen? But Lord Langston pulls the curtain aside and he's like, who are you? And then it dawns on him that it's Sarah. Yeah, it's a big surprise because he's certainly not expecting that that's who it's going to be. Yes. And so, of course, what does Lord Langston do by this intriguing woman who he finds in his uh, dressing chamber and who he also knows draws some naked men? And he's just so drawn to her. And so what does he do? But he kisses her. And yep. it is electrifying. Yep. They have their first kiss. Yeah. So pretty early on. And then the next day happens. And the next day, Matthew's working in his study when his dog runs into the room, Danforth, and Sarah comes in giggling behind him. She was trying to do a sketch of him, and he ran away from her. So then, of course, they're in close quarters, so this leads to a meaningful conversation. Everybody else has gone to the village that day except Sarah and Matthew, and she asks him why he doesn't go into the village, which he has a very sad tale about. So... He's very honest about it, and he believes that the village is a slightly a cursed place for him. What happened was he was told not to go to the village because there was a fever in the village, but he wanted to go to the village to bring his friend Martin, who he knew had the fever, some medicine. So he snuck away and went to the village to help his friend, and he came back, and him and his siblings all got this fever that was going around the village, and his siblings died. So he was actually the younger son, and he had an, a sister and a brother, and both of them died. And so did his friend Martin, who he'd gone to give the medicine to. So Lord Langston does not go to the village anymore because he wasn't supposed to, but he did anyway, and it ended very badly. So he does not go to the village. And she has a very similar story of loss because he feels so guilty, and she's like, I understand your guilt. She had mentioned earlier that she was afraid of horses, and she's like, I'm not – I'm afraid of horses, but it's because I had challenged my friend to a race and we were riding when we were young and her horse tripped at the end of the race and my friend was thrown and she broke her neck and died. And I feel so guilty because I was the one that challenged to the race. She's like, and I haven't been on a horse since. I found this a bit jarring because... I know we talk about our discussions at the end of the book, but I have to point out a little bit something about the way that this was, was, was put in. Because... We have known since the beginning as a reader that Matthew has a secret pain. And I pretty much identified immediately, even though we knew nothing about his family, I identified, oh, he's got second son syndrome. You know, yeah. he's obviously a second son and he feels guilt over his his older son that he inherited and yada, yada. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was pretty right about that. But then all of a sudden out of left field, Sarah's like, oh yeah, I killed someone too. <laughs> and yeah. it was a little bit like... Okay, because she hasn't had any development of of having this sad pain. She's had development on other aspects of her character about being in her sister's shadow and her being very unconfident about her looks and herself and being very down on herself and that society has always also looked down on her. So we had that. And then all of a sudden she's just like, oh, yeah. And then like I also feel like I killed somebody. So like I totally get it. And it, it I just found it a little bit like, uh, uh, okay. it was a kind of a bit of a side. It wasn't like it had been hinted about, 
Yeah. But it was more of a bonding moment for the two of them. For sure. And then she also finds out that Matthew's father passed away a year ago and he was shot by a highwayman and was there to rob him. And so he was killed and the guy who killed him was never caught. And so Matthew's dealing with like the death of his father and he has his guilt about other things. So yeah, they share this story of loss and he they start talking about family. And all this was triggered by a picture of a family and she thought he was the oldest person in the picture and he was actually the youngest pudgy boy with the glasses on. And she's like, you wear glasses? And he's like, I don't really anymore, but occasionally I still need them to read fine print. And she's like, oh, okay, glasses, great. Yeah, definitely fanning herself in that moment. Yes, and and they talk about family and this and that. And she talks about, like Zoe had mentioned, she doesn't feel confident with her looks. But part of it's because her mother never really built her up. She always built her sister up and kind of tore Sarah down a bit. And so she always talks about how she doesn't have a great relationship with her mother. She likes to play what she calls the senses game with her mother, oh, where she likes great. to say things like, I can't hear you. Why, yes, I have some paint. And it just <laughs> drives her mother crazy. Because yeah. she's like, I'm not blind. I can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was pretty good. I, or I really I'm not that. deaf. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, that's the senses game. Yes. Very good. I would love to use that on somebody one day. I know, it's great. And then they have a great one because Sarah's whole running thing is how she thinks. She's like, oh, I just don't understand gentlemen. She's like, well, in my opinion, all men are nincompoops, which Sarah uses very frequently throughout this book. Yeah, so I hate the word nincompoop. <laughs> so that didn't help help for me. But I, then I was I was actually curious. I was like, when did that word like come about? And so actually nincompoop was first recorded in 1670. Uh, and the origin is uncertain. So I, I did enjoy learning a little bit more about where it came from. It's a very old word. And so that's cool. Yeah, that is cool. Yes. Yeah, so they have this bonding moment of how they both think that men are nincompoops, which is very interesting coming from a man. Anyway, then everyone comes back from the village and they have this crazy dramatic news because guess what? The blacksmith was found murdered just outside of town. Ah. And Matthew's like, what is happening? Why was the blacksmith murdered? Was it just a coincidence? Does it have something to do with the fact that he was on my land? What is happening? And Matthew's like, oh no, Sarah did see me out the window, I think. Did she actually see me? Is she suspicious of me? And so he's like a little bit worried that Sarah might think he's somehow connected. And Sarah, meanwhile is a bit suspicious. She is because they said that the blacksmith was found in a shallow grave and she had seen Matthew returning with a shovel. Yeah, so definitely there's some weird stuff. She likes Matthew, but she just doesn't know. Yes. So then they have dinner and Matthew's friend Lord Sutton tasks himself because Matthew says, oh, well, Sarah did see me coming back from the garden that night when he was killed and he, and Lord Sutton's like I will see what she knows and so he's conversing with her during dinner and he comes back and he actually was like that Miss Morehouse she's actually quite wonderful and Matthew's like you can't think she's wonderful I know she's wonderful <laughs> I don't know if he thinks that she's wonderful but he he concedes at that moment and says I okay do, he concedes, he concedes oh I can see that you find her interesting is kind of as far as he goes because he does I believe it's this passage too that he still calls her the mousy Miss Morehouse yeah. I can see how you find the mousy Miss Morehouse interesting or something like that so anyhow I mean he he definitely like turns his opinion of her going from like what are you doing talking to a spinster mm -hmm. to like oh she's interesting and funny like you can have a conversation with her Yes, and that's what he says is, I have a quote right here. It's actually, I was going to say a talent for conversation, real conversation, not just because she is able to intelligently discuss an impressive array of subjects, but because she also listens intently as if what you're saying is of the utmost importance and interest to her. Yeah, that is a very nice thing that he says about her. Yes, and I think that's just very intrinsic to who she is. For sure. So anyway, they have dinner. She's now in her room and she's about to enjoy a bath. She puts some lavender in the water because that's her favorite scent. There's a lot of scent in this book. There is spicy cologne. Yeah, there's – anyhow. Anyhow. <laughs> and so Matthew saw her head to her room and order a bath. So he was like, oh, hey, I think we're in for a little quid pro quo here. So he sneaks into her room and he, he's not there in secret. He openly tells her he's there. Like, from the beginning. She hasn't even in the bath yet. And he's like, do you like this bath I've ordered for you? Yeah. I think is what he says. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Yeah. Or, yeah. And so she takes a bath and he's like, I'm just going to watch. Like, you know. You got to watch. Why shouldn't I watch? And I had a little moment where I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair. You got good reasoning. Yeah. She did it in secret. You're telling her she's you're in the room. She could technically throw you out. Yeah, she could. But she doesn't. But she doesn't. And that's when we have encounter number one. All right. So side note, I don't remember what they do in encounter number one. Is it just hand stuff? I think it's just hand stuff, but it's below the belt. Got it. It's below the belt hand stuff. Below the belt hand stuff. Yeah. Got it. He gives her an orgasm. Oh, lucky her. Yeah. (laughs) She got to have a bath and have an orgasm. Wonderful. That sounds like a great day. Yeah. (laughs) And after that, he leaves her room to go dig in the garden, but she follows him because she sees him sneaking out and she's like, I need to figure out what he's after because that blacksmith was buried in a shallow grave and he's going around carrying shovels. What is this man doing? Out she goes. Out she goes. And she does a very terrible job of sneaking up on him, but it's because he has his dog Danforth with him who promptly is like, hey, look, it's my friend Sarah. How's it going? Well, and he also does a terrible job sneaking around because it turns out he is allergic to roses, not all flowers, but roses specifically. So he's like sneezing up a storm and she's able to find him because he's in the rose garden. Yes. So she follows him and is like demands that he tell her what he's doing. And he's like, fine, I'll tell you. My dad on his deathbed gave me this confession about how there was money stashed in the yard. And frankly, he left me a lot of debts. And I'm really hoping to find this because otherwise I've got three weeks to figure it out. And then all those debts come due. And I need to marry an heiress in the next three weeks. So she's a little crust because she's like, well, I knew you were probably here to get married. And like, you're going to need an heiress. And I'm not that. Yeah. And she actually so far... Their relationship is pretty fresh, so she has been enjoying her time with him, but she isn't harboring any hope of marriage, but she, it is still a little bit, like, hard for her to hear it. Yes. He lays his cards on the table. He's like, this is what I'm dealing with. And she says, great, I'll help you dig. Yeah. She loves being in the garden. She loves like, it. That's fine. I, you can even do it in the, during the day because I always spend time in the garden, so I can dig whenever. Yeah. And so with that, they begin digging. And then they have some really lovely moments over the course of the week while they're digging for this treasure in the garden at random hours, mainly during the day, not at night. And I just want to point out, too, let's remember that there's a house party going on. There's at least, like, four other men there, at least the three women. There's also two elderly matrons. So there's, like, a house full of guests. Matthew is officially the worst host ever. Oh, yeah. He's never with his guests. And no one notices that Sarah's gone because most of the time she blends into the wallpaper. So, like, nobody thinks anything of the fact that she's gone, which I also find a little surprising that her sister and her friends aren't like, why don't you come hang out with us at all? Because they love her. That is very interesting, too. I think maybe it's because they've they've still been meeting for their book club. And it seems like they meet, like, every other night, even though we don't hear about book club as often during this. Fair enough. She has been seeing them because during this time they do build Franklin. They do. They they put him together. He's stuffed and ready to go. And he hangs out during their meetings. Yep. So like she does been seeing her friends. So I think that's why she can get away with just being in the garden during the day. Because they're like, well, we're still hanging out with her for book club at night. Good enough. You know, it's yes. it's a book. It doesn't all have to be perfect. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so they're digging and they're sharing moments of childhood. And he tells her this. there's a little lake on the property. And he says how he in secret built himself a pirate ship because he was obsessed with pirates when he was a kid. And then he rowed his boat that he built himself out into the middle of the lake where it promptly started to sink. And he was like, like any good captain, I went down with my ship. <laughs> um Aww. I could really I could really envision a small child in a little boat on a lake and the pride and the excitement of a little boy. I thought that was very cute. Yes. But as this is going on too, like they're digging, they're trying to find it, they're getting to know each other. He's also attempting to get to know her friend Julianne because he's found out that Julianne's really the only heiress at the party. Yep. So she's aware and she's kind of hurt like, oh man, I don't know if like I can see him if he marries Julianne. Like she's my friend and like he's going to be in my life. That's going to be terrible. Yeah, their relationship has progressed enough that she's starting to have much stronger feelings. And she's like, it it just would definitely be hard if he married her friend and she had to see him all the time. It would be better if they just, at the end of this house party, parted ways. Exactly. And But she's kind of resigned herself to the fact that she's going to have to marry Julianne. And she's figuring out how she's going to be able to deal with that. And we get to a point after all these weeks, Matthew is in his room one night 
thinking about his day with Sarah and his memories of going through the garden with her because they're the house party starting to come to a close. They've almost reached the last section of the garden. They're really in the last, they're in the home stretch. And if they don't find it, then he's going to really need to marry that heiress. And he doesn't understand how he can marry Juliana and see Sarah every day because he really has strong feelings for her. And he really love. he doesn't know he loves her yet, but he does care about her. And he doesn't want to see the hurt in her eyes when, if he's married to Julianne. So he, and he's looking at pictures that Sarah's given and she's drawn him some pictures. One of which is a picture of him as a little boy going down with his ship. And very he, sweet, very sweet. And he just is like reminiscing, thinking about it. And he comes to the conclusion that he can't marry Julianne. No, which is nice. I wasn't sure he'd get there. I thought it would be a little bit different, but he has decided that for the same reasons that Sarah was kind of stressed about, he doesn't feel he can marry Julianne. And this is actually a big decision for him because his dad on his deathbed had also requested that he marry within the year and start to produce an heir. So he felt like he was betraying his dad's loyalty if he didn't get in at least betrothed uh, by the end of this deadline, which was the house party. Yes. So, I mean, to be honest, I don't think Julianne would have accepted because they've barely hung out. She was she she maybe would have. She, we haven't learned that much about her uh, in this, but. I wasn't sure. Regardless, I thought it was nice that Matthew decided, you know what? I can't marry her friend. That's just not going to work out. I'll keep digging till the end of the time that I have, and then I will go to London, and I will then try to find an heiress. Because it's not just his dad's promise. Yes, his dad's promise is important, but also he is truly running out of funds. Yes. And so while he's reminiscing and coming to the realization that he can't marry Julianne, Danforth comes in and steals the sketch of him as a little boy that has become to mean so much to him. And so he chases his dog through the hallways to get the picture. And where does his dog stop? But right outside Sarah's door. I think this is, you know, a true Beethoven moment, right? Doesn't that happen in Beethoven where Beethoven yeah. will like bring things from one person to another yeah, to try to get to, them like, together? I was thinking it was more, Danforth reminds me more of Pongo in 101 Dalmatians Aww. of the Disney movie because like Pongo's like sees the ladies and he's like, I got to get my... Because he even says it because he refers to his human as his pet. He's like, I need to get my pet a mate because he's just lonely and he needs a mate. And he sees Perdita and her owner. And he's like, oh, look at that one. Oh, the lady is there pretty too. <laughs> so then Pongo goes hunting All right. for the humans and he wraps them in the leash and he brings them together. And so for me, Danforth is Pongo. All right. <laughs> Very cute. I can see it. So he knocks on the door because he needs to tell her about Julianne. But when he enters, he sp Sarah's all flustered and she's like, oh, man. Hi, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Hi. And he's like, um, excuse me, because he notices there is a boot in the wardrobe and it is a man's boot. And Matthew is furious because he's like, she's found another man already and I have all this care for her. And so he storms over to the wardrobe hurls open the door, reaches in, and pulls out Franklin. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. And he knocks his head off. And Sarah, of course, is not trying to explain Franklin's presence. She immediately admonishes him for toppling Franklin's head off. She's like, great, now I have to sew his head back on. He's like, <laughs> what is even happening right now? <laughs> and I was afraid this was going to get, like, super awkward, but it's pretty much just, like, yeah, we did this thing. Get over it. And he's like, okay, cool. Got over it. But now he's in the room and he tells her he's not going to marry Lady Julianne. And she realizes that she truly loves Matthew. And she, because she's so relieved to hear that he's not going to marry Julianne. Is she sad that he's still like on this heiress path? Yes. But she's also so relieved that he's not going to marry Julianne. And then things start to get heated and they have sex. They do. And I, I did appreciate that she was kind of like, you know what, I am quote unquote on the shelf and this is something I want and I'm going to experience it. And so she didn't have any kind of nervousness or regret or remorse at the start. She was just like, yeah, she had like this moment of thinking and then she was like, yep, this is what I want. So I am going to do this. No, and she really does it. And I just thought it was such a sex positive moment. Obviously, like we'll have more in the discussion later, but oh, we will. <laughs> okay. But I did think it was very positive because she took charge of it. Agreed. You know, he was like, I need to stop. And she's like, I don't want you to stop. Like, this is something I'm probably never going to experience again. And I want this for me. Yep. And I just love that 
that was kind of how she rolled with it. But anyway, um, they're digging the garden. He's got three days left to find this treasure because that's when he's going to cut this house party short. And they get to the end of the garden and it's so close. And she even hits a brick and she's like, I found something. But it was a brick. And so they've reached the end of the garden and he's dug everywhere else on his property and he can't think of another place where the treasure would be. So he admits defeat and says, you know, I have to leave. I have to go to London tomorrow and like go start my heiress finding mission. Yeah, I think he realizes too, like them being together longer only makes it harder because he has developed strong feelings for her. And in fact, his friend Lord Sutton is the one to inform Matthew that Matthew is in love with Sarah, that that's the feeling he's feeling. And Matthew is a little bit like, ah, but I have to pay my debts. I have to be honorable. So he says goodbye, I believe, to his house guests and then leaves earlier before they leave. Yes. I believe he and Sarah have one nice last night together. Oh, I think so I forgot to write that Encounter down. number three. We do have an encounter number three because they do have one last night together. This is what we get for both of us not writing the notes this time. I know. Well, <laughs> no, I also got that. distracted by my own bachelorette fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a pass. But yeah, no, I was going to say they're definite. You're totally right. There was there was a one more. There was farewell sex. Yeah, there was farewell sex. And he, he leaves her bed and immediately sets out for London and This whole time he's thinking about Sarah and he's thinking about how Lord Sutton told him he loves Sarah. And he's like, you're right. I do love Sarah. I absolutely love Sarah. And as far as we know, he just keeps setting out to London though. He does. He has like a moment where he kind of stops though at a fork in the road and decides he needs to do something else first. And I thought, oh, maybe his family has another property because at the beginning of the book, when he kind of divulges all the information to Sarah that his father had told him about the stuff in the garden, he gave Sarah all the words that his father said, which were kind of a weird jumble of words. Mm -hmm. And so he thought maybe her knowing those words would help. So then I, as a reader, thought, oh, maybe he's going to another property that they own or like a hunting cabin. Maybe that was the garden his father was referring to. Maybe he had a one last ditch effort. Yeah. I thought he was like going to the village for something. I don't know. He doesn't go to the village, Kelsey. (laughs) No, he doesn't go. But that's what I mean. I thought he was like going to take a step and like go to the village. I don't know. Okay. Well, obviously we were both wrong. We were both wrong. So Sarah is packing up and she's leaving and all the carriages are getting ready and she's literally walking out the door and she's like so sad. And, you know, she has this terrible moment with Danforth where he's like, she sees him sitting at the front door looking out for Matthew and the butler is like, oh, he always takes up that position when his lordship's away. And she's like, I feel you, Danforth. I feel you. And in fact, Danforth looks at her and she's like, I know, I'm leaving you too. And he's like, really? You too? God damn it. So as Sarah is getting ready to leave the party with her sister, all of a sudden, by Jove, she has an idea. And it has to do with those clues that Matthew said. And she was like changing the words in her head to mean something else. So she ends up saying something like a garden within a garden. What if it's a garden within a garden? And so she leaves her sister at the carriage, runs back through the house, back into the gardens to look in the garden where she first met Matthew with the flora fountain. Yes, because it was a very enclosed space and it was like its own garden within the garden. And she starts looking at the fountain itself and and the the different carvings on it and thinking that maybe there's something to do with the fountain. And so she's just about found something in the bottom of the fountain, I think it was. There was a crack and she was trying to remove it. it open. And yeah. someone comes up behind her. And who should it be? But Matthew. He has returned to her. Yes, he has. Because he cannot marry someone else. And she's like trying to point out the fountain to him. And she's like, but Matthew, I got something to tell you. And he's like, no, I have something to tell you. He's like, I cannot marry anyone else. I have to marry you. In fact, I've just gone to see your family and tell them that I have plans to ask you to marry me. And she's Uh like, what? And he's like, I love you. And she's like, I love you too. But like this fountain, like this is great fountain but they don't have time for that because then there is a twist there is a twist so we know that there's been other people attending this house party but they supposedly supposedly we get like (laughs) five seconds of interaction with like any of them yes so we don't really know much about them or anything but 
who should be coming through but Lord Berwick, who has been attending this house party. And he's like... Supposedly. Supposedly. (laughs) He's like, thank you for finding my money for me. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, and he's holding them at gunpoint. Like, it's they're having this moment, and then all of a sudden, in comes the villain with a gun. And he's like, yeah. I'll have my money, thank you very much. Yeah. And they're like, I'm sorry, what? They're like, what? And it turns out he, of course, does all the good villains do, which is tell them his whole backstory I wrote and that his down whole too. plan. <laughs> like, <laughs> I literally wrote that. I wrote something like, like all good villains do. I swear to fucking no. God. No. <laughs> he, like, tells them his whole plan, and he tells them that he shot Matthew's father because they'd been gambling together and Burroughs needed to earn money for his estate because he was going broke. And he found out Matthew's dad had just won a bunch of money. So he was like, I'm going to get that money from Matthew's dad. Matthew's dad. Matthew's dad. We don't know his name. His name is Matthew's dad. Exactly. So he plays him, but Matthew's dad wins and leaves with the money. And so he, little does he know that Matthew's dad had already stashed the money, but Berwick came on like a highwayman and went to rob him and shot him. To get the money. Yeah, so the villain actually premeditated his father's murder, which is another twist we weren't expecting and also a little bit out of the blue. And yeah. like a good villain, he just told them all that. Yeah, and he did. And he also <laughs> tells them, they're like, no one will ever believe you. Like, you can just let us go. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, this is a murder-suicide. Like, Sarah's mad because you had to marry an heiress and she really liked you and everyone knew that. So she killed you and then killed herself. If you're having a real hard time following this, it's because it's it's quite weak. Like, I, I don't think there's any bones about it the whole villain coming in at the end with the gun it's no, just a bit i mean it just like super weak <laughs> i mean it, it just comes out of nowhere and it's he's his part is over in five minutes yeah, and it's over pretty quickly because yeah, because sarah decides to just like distract him from matthew because maybe he can run and get help or something so she just is like well he's gonna kill us anyway i might as well scream yeah so that's what she does she screams and he turns to her and shoots the gun at the same time and Matthew has a knife in his boot and he pulls the knife out and throws it at Lord Berwick and buries it in his chest. Yep. So neither one of them is shot and Lord Berwick is dead, 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 dead. Super dead. And people rush in, the other party goers, which your guests haven't quite left yet, and they go ahead and check out the body. Definitely dead. Everybody accepts the story in a yeah. Blink of an eye. Yeah. And he came at us looking. He killed my father. He had us at gunpoint. And so I had to defend myself. And so then they remember, of course, that they need to look for the treasure. Yes. So because Sarah's like, I was trying to tell you the treasure is here. So she pulls out the brick at the bottom of the statue or whatever the thing that she wanted to pull and sticks her hand in. And there's nothing. Nothing there. But – But in another twist, yes, the bullet that had been fired during the standoff had hit the urn and a glint catches Matthew's eye because the urn of the statue has been chipped and a gold coin has fallen out into the water. Yes. And maybe his father wasn't saying fern. He was saying urn. Oh my goodness. So Matthew reaches in and pulls out a treasure trove of gold sovereigns. Lucky them. So now they already were getting married. Yes. They were just going to be poor married. But now... They're going to be rich married. They're going to be... Well, I don't think they're going to be rich married. They're going to be debt-free married with a little money left over. He does say that, doesn't yes. he? You're right. It's interesting that he can look at a pile of gold and be like, yes, this will do debt plus... Plus, plus help us a little bit more. Yeah. Like, we're still going to have some groundwork to do, but we're not going to be destitute. Yeah. And then... The book ends, but there's an epilogue. Oh my goodness. It's our first epilogue, guys. And it's very cute because they get married. And is that it? Well, and then they have a really magical moment of Matthew's like, we're going to conquer all these things together. And they go to the village on a horse and Sarah sits in front of him. Oh, that's true. They do that thing. They conquer their fears together. And they ride to the village and and live happily ever after. They ride to the village and live happily ever after. Yeah. And that is the story of Sarah Morehouse and Matthew Devonport. I mean, that's one way to look at it. (laughs) (laughs) So before we get a little bit deeper into our opinions, shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall.
Today we have a lovely recommendation from our listener, Cecilia. Cecilia, thank you for this recommendation. She's recommending that you guys check out A Notorious Vow by Joanna Shoup. This is not quite Regency, but a little later, it takes place in Gilded Age, New York. So we're going across the pond, y'all. And the hero is deaf. Yeah, that is the facts that she gave to us. She said it was a fun novel to read. So thank you so much for your recommendation. Yes, thank you, Cecilia. So we would love to hear from all of you guys. We want to hear your recommendations, especially if you've got something that you think is a little bit out of what we're talking about on this podcast, maybe just adjacent, but you think everybody needs to know about it, we want to hear about it. I wish we could do, you know, six of these a week. I wish we could, this could be daily, but unfortunately, <laughs> the whole reality of recording, editing, uploading, real life, it just takes a Working little bit Working regular more. full-time jobs. It sure does. Unfortunately, we can't quit our full-time jobs and be professional podcasters yet. But, you know, that's the dream, right? <laughs> no, but honestly, we want to hear about your recommendations. We want to share with all of our community because we all love to read so much. It's funny. I'm staying at Kelsey's house this weekend, and I was so bad. I stayed up. I started reading a book at like 9.30 last night, and I stayed up till 2.30 a.m. to finish the book because it was so good. And so did I. <laughs> <laughs> Separately in different rooms. She comes out this morning. She's like, oh, I stayed up late reading. And I was just like, high five. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We do read a lot and we'd love to share everything with you. But that's why we also want to hear from you guys too. Absolutely. And even if you don't have a book recommendation, but you have something else you'd like to tell us about, you can email us at romancepod at gmail.com. You can also check out our other social media. We are on Instagram at T as in Tom, N as in Nancy Strumpets. That is our handle. We also are at romancepod.com. And you can check out our YouTube channel. Yeah, we're going to be putting the podcast, the full episodes on YouTube. So you'll be able to find that there. Theoretically, there, there may be some bonus content on there. But as Kelsey and I are in separate places, uh, it's not it can as, be hard. It, yeah, it maybe won't be quite as likely. But we're definitely going to have some stuff on there. And we've also got a Facebook page. Join our community with all the other people who love this genre. And maybe you can trade book recommendations there, get to know other listeners. Uh, all sorts of fun stuff happens on Facebook groups. So we are also facebook.com slash T as in Tom, N as in Nancy, strumpets. So take a look. Yes. And finally, we have one last ask for you. So the first six weeks of a podcast are absolutely the most critical, according to the internet. So when this airs, this is going to be within the first six weeks. So what that means is we need you, if you like what we're doing, we need you to rate, to review, and to subscribe. That's what's going to help other people find us. And you could also maybe tell a friend. Yes. Rate, review, subscribe. Woo. All right, Zoe, there's opinions. Many, many opinions. So what are your general thoughts about this book? So I really enjoy it. This is the one that made me really like romance novel, and I totally know why I felt that way when I was rereading it. Yes, there were some times where I wished Sarah had a little bit more self-confidence, but I did really like that, you know, she was a little self-conscious. At the time, I was living in New York, I had moved away from everyone I knew. And while I'm usually a fairly confident person, it was kind of hitting my confidence in the sense that I really didn't know where I stood with a lot of people. And I wasn't quite making those immediate friendships that I had or like the one friendship I did have, it like kind of exploded in a bunch of drama, which was unnecessary. Like it was just unnecessarily drama. And I was kind of losing my own confidence at that point. And so I really understood where she was at with like feeling not confident in social situations with other people because she kind of just wanted to read and do that. And that's kind of what I was. I wanted to read. I spent a lot of time watching Netflix and reading. Um, but then also, too, I just really liked that throughout the whole thing, like, yes, even though at the first he maybe thought she was an uppity spinster or, like, was going to be a problem, but as he got to know her, he really hated hearing her say negative things about herself. And he really was trying to, like, build her up. And he wasn't trying to get at her by tearing her down. I love that's what you took away from this. And I think it's really cool too that like, I, I, I think it's really great how different books affect us differently and especially at different times in our lives. I disagree a little bit on, well, I don't disagree. I agree that Matthew didn't tear, continue to 
tear her down. I think Matthew could have built her up a lot more. Not that that's his responsibility, but that often is kind of the character trope, right? That they, that through another, through a a relationship in their lives, they learn to see themselves in a different light. Yes. So you ready for my opinion? I'm ready for him. Like, give him to me, Zoe. Okay. I hated this book. I <laughs> I hated it so much. Three sentences into this book, I knew I wasn't going to like it. And then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm just tired or something. I'm going to put it down. I'm going to go back to it on a day I have better energy. And I thought, but no, I just, I really did not like it. And I had this brief interlude. It was weird because you texted me like that you had just finished it. And right at that moment was where I had this like, oh, this book has turned a corner. I am excited. And then like 10 pages later, it just completely fell apart. So I had three major problems with the book. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem that I have is the writing. Okay. In my opinion, the writing is is poor. Okay. Which, like, don't get me wrong, I don't think I can go out and write any better than this. In fact, as I was reading this book, I thought, if I tried to write one of the, you know, plot ideas that I had in my head, I bet it would turn out very similar to this. But (laughs) because I think, like, writing is an art and a craft and you have to do it a lot to be Mm -hmm. good at it. Or at least those of us with maybe not the most natural gift for it. Number two, I really didn't like the main characters. Okay. And number three, I really didn't like the plot. And uh, I'll save my fourth thing for a little bit later in our our discussion. But I will say, though, one of the strongest characters in this book was Danforth. Oh, oh, 100%. Danforth is great. Great, greatest dog ever. Totally, (laughs) totally into Danforth. He is the comedic relief, but also helps the plot along. And he just makes you smile. Yes. I I won't argue with that. So here we go. Okay. (laughs) So the writing. Um, Chapters 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 13, and I believe chapter 14 ended with a sentence starting with the word and. And she knew she had to find out what he was doing. Ah. And it was like around chapter 7 where I was like, I swear to God, I've heard this a lot. And so I went back and I was like, no, it was 6 because it was like 6 and 5 and 4 and 3. And I was like, whoa, come on, editor. So the other thing is, as I was reading the book, all of a sudden I was like, man, I swear I've read this word a lot of times. And so I'm reading on a nook, which means I have the find feature, right? Rather than when you're reading a novel, a paper version. And so I decided to find the word gaze and see how many times she used the word gaze in this book. (laughs) Do do you want to give a guess? A lot. A lot. (laughs) So she used the word gaze 188 times in this book. That's a lot. It's a lot. So... To to give some context, I decided to look two other books up. One of them was the one that we both read that we alluded to in another podcast that we were talking about all the wigs. And uh, that book is From the Wilds of Linlow Castle, although the name escapes me. It's the most recent one about Lady Boudicca. Anyhow, Eloisa James uses the word gaze in that book 18 times. So a little bit for context. It's still, obviously gaze is going to be used a lot in this kind of writing. Yes. And then in The Perils of Pleasure, I believe it's used 22 times. So, I mean, just obviously like in general, adjectives are like are poorly chosen in this book too. So for example, there's a sentence that says her errant gaze continually wandered. So like errant means like straying from the proper course. So to me, like you didn't need continually wandered. Like her gaze was already errant. Like, you know what I mean? Like I get what you're saying. It was just like, and there were just a lot of uses like this. There were also, I didn't like the, her use of scent. Like it was, it was very cliche over the top scent. So that was why I was like, it just, it happened a lot, but it was always slightly different. It wasn't like she smelled his sandalwood. It was like she smelled his lemon and bergamot, and then she smelled his sandalwood, and then it was clean linen, and then it was like freshly laundered some, you know? <laughs> so it just was like a little, yeah. okay, a lot I of- get that. And I think that even when I'm writing even just small things, like when I write an email or anything, or even just writing the captions for this, I try to make sure I'm not using the same words over and over again. So mm-hmm. I do get- the sense of feeling it was very repetitive. And I will say even sometimes I thought it was repetitive. I think, and I will say this, I'm not as critical about writing. Like if it's truly terrible writing, like I will have a hard time reading it. But for this one, it was just more, for me, I think it wasn't so concerning for me because like the whole plot was kind of light and fluffy. Mm -hmm. So for me, the writing was light and fluffy. Because it wasn't really being particular. It was just kind of like light and fluffy. It gets the point across. So. But I have three more points about the writing that I didn't like. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. So there were a lot of 
repetitive catchphrases where like with Danforth, who's the comedic relief, he would always be like, I taught him that. And he probably says that about seven times in the book, like I taught Mm -hmm. him that. And then there's also the whole, I can believe enough for both of us, which the main characters, Matthew will say that I absolutely hated and made my skin crawl. And I'll get to that later when we talk about Matthew uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, And he repeats that uh, at least three, if not four times in the book. And it's one of the very last lines. And I literally like went like, because I hated it so much. (laughs) Sorry for your ears there. I tried to move away from the mic. (laughs) They also finish each other's sandwiches. Uh, or sentences. So at least three instances in the book where they said absolute something like, in my opinion, like absolutely stupid in unison. So like they were talking about the weather and then they both go, it is what it is. Ha ha ha. But up, up, but up, up. What? Like it just was like, really, really, I just didn't like it. So I didn't pick up on that, but I did pick up on, there was a number of points in the book where she would have a thought and then he would say it. And that happened quite a bit. Yeah, but they did have the unison. Yeah, she would have a thought and then he would say it, like when he said the word nincompoop. And she was like, oh, he uses that word, which is, I mean, that that's fine. But I didn't like the, the unison stuff. The author also unnecessarily summarizes things. Like at three points in the book, she summarized the book up until now through character dialogue. So like the character is summarizing, you know what I mean? So it just, it got a little bit, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to read them because they're long. Oh, but there, there was one sentence at the end where Sarah said like, and how ironic that it was Beerwick's shot that gave us the final clue. Like, oh my um, goodness. And I was just like, oh God, come on. And then <laughs> when they ride the horse to the village and when, when he suggests, when Matthew suggests in the epilogue that they ride a horse to the village, Sarah says, rather like killing two birds with one stone. And I was just like, no shit. Like, (laughs) oh my God. And just in general, I felt like the writing was very immature. So for me, and and that obviously is a huge turnoff for me. I guess we're finding this out about Zoe, right? Yes, we are. (laughs) So uh, a couple quotes. (laughs) Oh God. (laughs) Okay. So like, again, her image materialized in his mind's eye. I don't like sentences like that. So, but the other one that I was just like, so blown away with are... Her golden brown eyes looked like wet topaz jewels glittering behind her askew spectacles. And I was just like, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) What is going on? So I don't know. It just, for me, the writing is a huge turnoff. I probably wouldn't have finished this book if we had been not reading it for the podcast. That's okay. I've straight not finished up uh, finished books before. Yeah. And I mean, it's fine. It's just, I, and I feel like if, if it's not for you, then like, don't no. push it unless you and have a I podcast think, to record. <laughs> no, and I think that there are, and I think it's something to be said for when you're having, like you are turned off by writing. See, I think I have a little bit more, and I've noticed this about myself and people are like, oh, it's so terribly written. I was like, eh, it wasn't great, but like, it was fine, you know, when it comes to writing. But for me, like writing doesn't, it's important, but it's not as important for me. Like I need characters. And while like you maybe didn't like the characters, like for me, the characters, they had their them. flaws, but I identified with them. But then also too, there was nothing about them that really turned you off about them. Like ooh, there's some, ooh, they maybe turned ooh. you off, but for me, oh I wasn't turned <laughs> off by them. And so for me, I was like, oh, it's like, cause everything's light and fluffy. And like, yes, they have things, but like, I'm not really super turned off by any of it versus like I've had books for like two chapters and I really hated both main characters. Fair enough. Like hated them. And I I also find this super interesting because I think you're a much better writer than me. So for you to be like, whatever about the writing and me to be like, you know what? Let's also (laughs) preface this that like I was also reading this like the week after I finished four weeks of summer camp for small children. So Uh like I may have just been like in this is like me reliving my past. It's like me watching a Disney Channel movie being like, this movie's great. And then maybe when I'm actually in a critical mood, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of problems with this movie. There's nothing wrong with Smart House. Yeah. No, (laughs) nothing at all. Yeah. Um, so, like, I maybe just read it very quickly and was, like, just fried. But I will stand by it. I liked the characters. I had no problem with the characters. I will say Danforth was probably, like, way stronger than the villain, though. Uh, uh, Danforth absolutely. had way more development and way more bearing on this plot than the villain did. So, speaking of the plot, like, I obviously, like, I think we both agree that the plot was kind of weak. Like, it, it, everything was very light and fluffy. And then all of a sudden at the end, it got tips and tricks. I think, too, off, based off, like, We read so many books that were so twisty and turny in the plots that for me, it was kind of a nice break in that system because I was like, 
oh, things are progressing. Oh, look, cards are on the table. Oh, this was unnecessary, but that's okay. But like, okay, here we go, here we go. But it was just, to me, I, I totally agree. And I am all for a simple plot. I don't think a plot needs to be convoluted or crazy or anything. Like convoluted's got negative connotations anyway. But like, it just like the end of, you know, the villain coming in and, oh, and I actually murdered your father. And we already, we already talked about the bad villain. But yeah. it's really like in The Princess Bride when he's like, there's too much. Let me sum up, you know? <laughs> so that's how I felt. So it was a little bit much. And I just like, I just felt like this book had a lot of cliches in it, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of, and a lot of c- cliches that she went with the actual cliche where instead of like setting up a cliche and then doing something unexpected or setting up a cliche and pulling it off. So I heard this on another podcast, uh, a week ago. And it really stuck with me because he was talking about cliches. He was actually talking a little bit, a a little different subject here. But I'd like to read this quote about cliches because I think it's super pertinent to this whole genre. This genre like thrives on cliches, Mm -hmm. right? It thrives on tropes. Yes. Anyhow, so this is from a podcast called Best Pick, and it's where they discuss all of the Best Picture Oscar winners in no particular order. It's a fun podcast. I totally recommend you check it out. And this is Tom Selinsky talking. And he says, And again, I want to underline this because I think people often get this wrong, or when I put this point of view across, I feel like I'm being misinterpreted. Avoiding cliches is easy. Anyone can avoid a cliche. Anyone can just do not that. The problem is that cliches exist because they've been successful in the past. They work. So the question is, can you come up with something that avoids the cliches and does something better and more interesting? That is a very small target to hit. And it's, it's so true. So yeah. I, I get it. The target is small and I don't have a problem with reading cliches, but the problem is if you pair a lot of cliches and a lot of, we finish each other's sandwiches, you know, <laughs> with each other, it just, to me, it really degrades the whole experience. Okay. And I also felt with the plot that it was weak, not just because of the villain, right? I felt like we had this in the beginning, we're given like these words that his father said, and we have this knowledge that Sarah is a horticulture expert, and they don't solve it until the very last second when it's kind of a Hail Mary, right? That she runs out there and she wouldn't have actually found the stuff, had Mm -hmm. the shot not ricocheted. So it really was a Hail Mary to me. And I, I felt like that was too bad. Like it would have been really cool if everything had aligned a little bit better or throughout the whole time she had helped him solve. But instead, they spent days and days and days. And got nowhere. Digging. Yeah. He said the rose garden was two acres and they went through the whole rose garden. His gardens are known to be spectacular and legendary. And over the past year, he's literally dug the whole thing up. What the fuck does his garden look like? Like, it's got to be a mess. (laughs) I just, I really was like, so his gardener thinks he's taken a sudden interest in horticulture and yet he's just like digging holes and leaving them there? Like what? How? No, he fills his holes back up. Yeah, but like... (laughs) What is he doing? Like taking the plant out, dividing it and putting it back in. And like, okay, he doesn't know that much about gardening. That's for sure. So the point being that I was just like, "Mm, this is a little bit crazy. But I also thought it was weird because when they're having the discussion about whether or not he killed the blacksmith or not, because Sarah confronts him a little bit about Mm -hmm. that, she has this really heartfelt moment where she's like learning about his family and his grief. And she says, no, I don't believe you could kill anybody. And then he kills a guy and they celebrate finding gold over his dead corpse at the end. Like he's just, the corpse is still there as far as I could tell. That's true. I think someone (laughs) covered it. But still. (laughs) Like, you're right. Because she does say, I don't believe you could kill a man. And uh, maybe they should have like prefaced that with like, I don't think, like, I could never kill a man except in protecting you. Yeah. Or or if there had been some sort of like humor line at the end of that where they like nervously giggled because the anticipation of everything, like it, there could have been a better way, but instead because it was just completely not mentioned and they like skipped around the fountain with their gold, uh, you know, jumping over his I did wonder how Matthew was just so good with throwing a knife. Really good at knives. Like really good at knives. Like because he not only, like Berwick turned from him, he was able not only to pull, like I think he did have a knife out at some point. Yeah, he did. And he threw it on the ground, like far enough away. But he had a second knife in his boot. So he had enough time to bend down, pull the knife out of his boot, aim and throw. While Berwick, granted, I'm. let's assume that Matthew's on the left and she's on the right. So his right arm is probably swinging towards the right. So it's like opening up the target, but still like straight through the heart. That's really epic. Like I would have just gone, I would have been fine with he was maimed. Like 
I didn't remember him being killed. I like I was like, oh cool, he's gonna maim him. Like it's fine. Yeah. So shall we talk about these characters a little more in depth? Yeah. So we can at least like start with opinions. Uh your ratings, I'm sure, are gonna be real low. What are they? I want to hear. I want to hear. My ratings? You want me to start with my ratings before backing it up with any facts? Okay, fine. Yeah. So, Matthew. Uh, Matthew's a two. I hate Matthew. Okay. It's Well, maybe Matthew's a three. So, it's just like, you know, if anybody's watched Arrested Development, um, there's Anne, who is George Michael's girlfriend, and the whole joke always is, her? Like, they always forget who she is. And to me, Matthew is utterly forgettable. He, like, comes a little bit, comes around a little bit at the end, but, like, I didn't need him to love her and propose to her without the money. Like, I appreciate a practical guy. And Mm -hmm. they had already agreed that, you know what? I didn't find it romantic that he was, like, throwing caution to the wind at the last minute and galloping back for her Mm -hmm. after asking her parents' hand. Like, maybe he... Maybe he was just compelled to come back or something. I know he needed to get back there to advance the plot, but I think there could have been another way to do it. I didn't need that, like, I'm going to your parents and I'm going to ask. I just felt like his reasons were practical enough. But, like, also he's the worst host ever. does not hang. <laughs> <laughs> and then his line of, like, enough for both of us, to me, is a real, like, cop-out and super slimy. So at one point when they first kiss, she says something to the effect of, like, I can't think of any reason that you would kiss me. And he's like, don't worry. I can think of enough reasons for both of us. And, like, two pages before then, he's like, I don't know why I'm attracted to this this plain, bespectacled spinster. And Mm -hmm. I, as a reader, was just like, well, then what are the fucking reasons, Matthew? Like, (laughs) I was so... I was so incensed. I was like, what reasons? I just felt like it was like real, like, you know, putting the moves on. And okay. I wanted there to be some sort of development from that where where Sarah starts to see the reasons and she never does. But I'm still talking about Matthew. So like, he fights being attracted to Sarah for too long, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And once he admits he does, he does not change his adjectives about her. Like, there's still, to me, he uses really demeaning adjectives about Sarah. He never defends her to his, in my opinion, even shittier than him friend, Langford, or what Sutton. is it? Sutton. So to me, Sutton's, I do not like Sutton. Even though we read the the one nice thing he says about Sarah, I do not like him. And at the end, he told her mother off, and then her father just, quote, nodded at him gratefully, like, oh, thank you, Valiant Knight. Like, oh, thank you for going to her rescue and telling her that you told her mother that you're marrying her, not her sister, and you love her. It just, it just, it felt so disingenuous to me. So okay. I I don't like Matthew. Okay. But you did. I did. I had no problems with Matthew. Because, like, I feel like, and maybe it's just a very common thing within these series is we get heroes who, like, thou doth protests too much you know mm-hmm. like yeah. he and he doesn't really want he doesn't want to have feelings for sarah he know nope. like he's intrigued by her and yes he doesn't really defend her to his friend but i think you get the internal dialogue where he is like he doesn't like that his friend's saying it but he doesn't want his friend to like be pushy about it and it's just because i think he's just trying to convince himself that he's not into her he for sure is trying to convince himself that he's not into Because her. it doesn't fit in with his plans. And so that's why he's doing it. Fair. But I, again, maybe this is why, like, I really didn't like this book is because the, the choice of adjectives, right, that the author uses, that Matthew uses. So, like, she writes when, at one point, the problem was it seemed he'd developed a freakish and completely inconvenient preference for the unusual. So, therefore, she's like – saying Sarah is unusual, which fine, unusual can be fine, but freakish and, you know, inconvenient, unusual, using all those terms, there isn't anything like endearing about it, right? There's nothing yeah. that, that kind of makes it better. I also like, <laughs> there's one sentence where he had a number of female acquaintances whom he liked, but wasn't attracted to in that way. And that just really made me feel like I have black friends. Like, you know, I have black friends, you know, and it just, ugh. anyhow. Yeah, I... I get what you're saying. For me, he wasn't as bad. And I think that in all this being said and done, I know he was fine for me. And I think that he, yeah, for me, he's like, he's like an eight. He's not like a 10. An eight? An eight. Wow. I know. You're so so on the other end of the spectrum. I know. But it's because like, (laughs) there's nothing wrong with him. But I think the whole idea of the adjectives didn't change and nothing really changed is, as you said, like the writing was slightly a little bit less mature. Yep. He's fine for me. But he's like, He's eight. Sarah, on the other hand, for me, is a seven. 
Okay. Tell me more. Um, I liked her. I loved that she was smart. She wasn't afraid of being smart. I loved that she was very open about her interests with horticulture. I liked that she kind of was just there to do her thing. I did not like her self-deprecatingness a bit. Yeah. Like, she didn't know why she was there. She was literally just there for her sister. Like, wasn't there for herself. I Like, the only reason why she's a seven for me, though, is because she did – when she stood up for herself, she stood up for herself. And she wasn't afraid of standing up for herself. She did have her own internal conflicts, which I felt didn't quite go along with how her internal tearing herself down did not quite go with her strong persona that she seemed to put on with other people. That's true. And I think that that's relatable because I know a lot of people who feel – poorly about themselves can often put on a facade. You know, a lot of the time people with depression, you don't know that they have depression, even if they're your loved ones or the people around you because they're so good at hiding it. And yeah, so I also found that a bit sad. Eventually I got over it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was like, especially like you said, you were mad because Matthew was fighting his feelings for her for too long, in your opinion. For me, Sarah wasn't getting her confidence fast enough. Agreed. Because like, she would, she'd stand up for himself and you know, Matthew was trying to build her up in cases. Like, maybe he wasn't defending her to a friend, but when he spoke to her, if he heard her tearing herself down, he was like, no, that's not who you are. And so for me, her internal dialogue didn't change nearly as much. Like, even at the end, she was like, why? Yeah, that last line of, like, that that same thing that I said before, like, I can't think of any reasons that you would kiss me. He says something about, like, well, you're the perfect woman. And she's like, I can't think why you would – think that way and he says I can think of enough reasons for both of us and that's the end of it and it's like that's where she leaves there's no development yeah no so I felt like that was a little bit that's why like she's seven maybe I just need to be more critical I don't know hey you know (laughs) it's only episode five and we know that I am such a critic so Sarah Mm -hmm. I felt a lot more strongly than you did about her lack of Mm self-confidence. And I also think it's really interesting. Like, I liked hearing about when you first read this, how you identified with that. And so therefore you, like, you took it to a different place, right? Mm -hmm. And it made you feel a different way. And And it seemed like it was a positive thing. But then I feel a little bit like, no, we need to hashtag feminism. We need to, like, show our young people that don't have confidence that they should be confident in themselves. So I know that's what you're saying after reading it this time that you wished that she had had more confidence and had more of a change in the book. And I definitely did because I felt like Sarah hates herself. Mm -hmm. I felt like she just is so down on herself. She is so self-deprecating. And it's like to a point when it's like a little bit uncomfortable for me to keep reading about her. Because like at the end, she doesn't emerge from her chrysalis a new person, right? Like an ugly duckling story is fun, right? Like she's all that. Okay, probably some some problems with that if I was to watch it now. But like I still have also fond memories about that or – Or just in general, like any ugly duckling story can be really fun to read. But to me, I get the most fun out of that is not that they're beautiful. Like that's like, you know, cool, a cool addition. But to me that they feel different about themselves and they spread that good feeling around them. Agreed. So I felt like the only time that she felt happy was when Matthew had adoration for her. But it didn't stick, right? Like Like the quote we already talked about, at the end, she doesn't feel better but in the moments when he's when he's you know Mm -hmm. praising her or something that it's good but like I also feel like the author hates Sarah there's one sentence here where she writes botheration even her scalp felt hot which as she knew would make her already uncontrollable curls frizz even tighter it's like that's Sarah's internal dialogue and like it's just there's so much negativity in the words and we're gonna get to more of that later Mm -hmm. but I also felt I was really upset. Like, why was she so confident about her friend's death, the one who died on the horse, and not confident about her own self, self-worth? self She didn't seem that bothered by her friend dying on the horse. She was like, oh, yeah, it was sad. I don't ride horses anymore. Where Matthew is like, my whole life has changed. I don't go to this village. Like, I, I make other people go for me. I'm a shaking mess when it comes to it. And there was so much development. And then Sarah was like, oh, yeah, I also had a friend that died. Oh, because of me. You know? And I just was like, well, you seem to have – Whatever that means to you, like you seem to have gotten over that and come to terms with it, but you just can't come to terms with your own self-worth. And I get it. Her mother was abusive. Her mother was verbally abusive. But there are other stories where the parents are abusive and they they come at the end to a better point. And I just feel like she didn't. There's like a few quotes that I have to read because 
she's like frequently stunned into forgetting things, which is fine, right? Like, you know, she's all of a sudden been tongue tied or whatever, but then she's so self deprecating. Yeah. With a frown, she forced herself to concentrate and her faulty memory kicked back into life. You know, it's just okay. And like, also, like at one point, and she braided her unruly hair into a plain, single thick plait. She looked the same as she did every night, utterly plain. And at that, I wrote, we effing get it. You don't like her. <laughs> like, that's how I feel like the author just constantly is tearing Sarah down. So to me, Sarah is also a two because mm-hmm. she gets zero development. And I, I don't feel like this is Sarah's fault. I actually feel like Sarah and Matthew, like, had so much potential and the author let them down. To me, it just was a bummer because all of the things you liked about them – Pretty much, like, all of the traits that you liked about them are also things that I thought were cool. Like, it was a cool character, but then there were just so many things that just tore them down to me. Okay. So she's a two. So she's a two. But even as we've kind of touched on, and you even talked about it where there's everything was really cliched, I think that's a really good understanding of the tropes that we're talking about here. I mean, there's all kinds of, there's, like, the idea, it's not quite an arranged marriage, but it's the idea that, like, he has to marry a particular someone that's not her you know, she's a bit of a fish out of water at this house party because she's just not been around in society because she had that verbally abusive mom who didn't really care about putting her in her best light, was only really concerned about her sister. Yeah, I mean, she's for sure a wallflower. She's not in society. Her sister married up, which is why her sister is now a lady and which is why they move in these circles. She's just a physician's daughter, but she was a blue stocking and a wallflower. Yes. And then you have the idea of forbidden love because like he's falling for her, even though he's not supposed to marry her. Yeah. He needs to marry an heiress because he's on the clock. Yeah. There's a bit of opposites attract. She's always talking about how magnificent he looked and like how gorgeous he was and like this and that. And then she's so like, the thing is, her description of herself, though, is always so down, and I think we only get her physical description from her. I thought of her as being, like, a frumpy person with just had a good personality. And then yeah. I reread it, and I realized, I was like, her description actually wasn't as a frumpy person. Like, she was a decent-looking person. She just had, like, frizzy hair and glasses. Like, but other than that, like, she, she was like, oh, I'm actually fairly tall, you know? And I'm like, okay, so you're tall and, like, normal-boned, and, yeah, like, you, your hair's curly. Okay. Yeah, and I was kind of expecting a she's all that moment where, like, you know, they straighten her hair and take off her glasses. We didn't get that, which is fine. We don't need to have a makey makeover, right? No. We just need to, like, at least, like, emerge a beautiful butterfly in spirit. Well, and then we have our ugly ducklings and their scars, sure. their stories of loss and Yeah, they bond over their similar yes. stories. There's a murder mystery. Sacre bleu! His <laughs> father was actually murdered. <laughs> and they have to solve a puzzle. They have to like go on a treasure hunt together. Yeah, they do. It's not much of a hunt. It's just kind of a dig. <laughs> yeah, it's a dig that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, it's funny because you talk about the writing and I just keep talking about Danforth. And so I'm not going to lie, even after all these tropes, like, you could have like the best friend pal in these tropes and for me Danforth is the best friend pal for sure um, because he's the best and so therefore my quote is a Danforth quote this is your favorite quote from the this book this is my favorite quote from the All book alright um, Danforth who appeared to be grinning sat at her feet actually most likely on her feet Matthew didn't doubt rendering her unable to move and it occurred to him that Danforth was one damn smart dog because <laughs> basically his dog's like I'm gonna pin her down so you can ha- converse with her going to pin her down for you. Good boy. (laughs) So my favorite quote was in the beginning of the book, I believe, before she even sees him in the bath. I could be wrong. But somewhere around the first third of the book, Sarah is thinking, when he'd stood next to her, her pulse had misbehaved in the most unsettling, confusing, and unprecedented way, a way she hadn't liked one bit. And that, I thought, was a good moment of writing. Yeah. So what did you think about the steaminess of this book? So for me, it was just a nice cup of tea. All right. Because it wasn't like I was in love with it because it was like super steamy and it was so hot and I loved the characters. It was just more like, like I said, I just, everything was light and fluffy for me. It's so like right ready to sip. Yeah, exactly. When I read it the first time, I think that was what I needed. I needed light and fluffy and a story. Yeah. And then same thing when I think I read it this time, like one, I've built it up in my head. I know I will say that probably played a factor in it from the beginning, mm-hmm. but I also just come off like a crazy amount of busyness in my regular life and like trying to get this done. And I was rereading this book I remembered really liking. And so for me, it was like light and fluffy. Well, I'm glad that you felt that way. For me, 
I had not one single butterfly. (laughs) I was like, seriously, this is like Chernobyl, like dead zone, like absolutely nothing. I had like a moment when she was watching Lord Langston in the bath and had those kind of lines about it where I was like, oh, we're getting saucy here. Like, this is fun. And yeah. then, like, he immediately said something kind of like, slimy that I didn't like, and it was just okay. dead for me. So to me, this was, this is an even tea. This is like someone forgot to serve me tea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think now we're getting to the crux of my okay. frustration here with there this you go. Book. We have our feminist recap. So okay. how do you feel about it? Um, For me, it was neutral because there were moments – where I thought it was very positive, where Sarah was like standing up for herself and just like, you know, no, no I want this. And I thought that Sarah, but it was the same thing I had with Sarah as a per, as a character. She was so strong, could easily stand up for herself and was like, no, I'm going to figure this out. Like, you can't push me aside. You know, I'm going to take this for me. If we're going to have sex, it's because I want to, not just because you are pushing me or because I don't know what's happening. It's like, no, I've thought about this. I've made my decision. That was great, but all the self-deprecating and how all the self-deprecating came from her. Like, Matthew had his own trials and tribulations, but none of it was, like, because he was uncomfortable with himself. True. Like, everything from him was more outside forces versus all of her problems were internal forces. And like I said, she didn't get her confidence quite up as much as I would like. Uh, I totally agree. And I think I said at the beginning, like, I think it's great that we have different opinions and I'm not here to change your mind about this book because I think it's great what you took away from it, but I am 100% here to change your mind that this was a huge offender. (laughs) So let me get started. So the reason that I think this book is a huge offender, now right, this was written 19 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. No, 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 not quite. It was written about 10 years ago. Yeah, it came out right before I read it 10 years ago. So I do believe that like some things have changed and maybe this author today. And that's why I also checked to see when this author has written her last book, because I was kind of interested, like maybe she's gone through a bit of a transformation, you know? And I think like the more books you write, the better you get at it, hopefully, but also like the more kind of mature you get with a lot of things. So I was, I was hoping for that, but she hasn't written a book in five years that I could find. So anyhow, but the author hates Sarah. Like, to me, the author hates Sarah. Okay. And I, like, I wondered if the author was, like, internalizing her own battle or her own time of her life or mm-hmm. whatever, like, kind of w- with Sarah on the page. Yeah. It's so, like, I'm all for an ugly duckling. But the language that Sarah uses about herself and the author uses about Sarah and the other characters use about Sarah is degrading and she never grows or transforms. So Matthew has to do the damn thinking for her in the end when he's like, I can think of fathom enough reasons for both of us. And it's like, I, I know we've already said that, but it it kills me. So I'm going to read a few quotes, and I think this is going to help us get to this point. It's going to be a few. Maybe I'll edit some of them out. But (laughs) So here's one from Matthew's point of view where he says or thinks, for there could be no other explanation as to why he'd harbored the least sensual thought about a woman who was not in the least bit sensual, and certainly not at all the sort of female to inspire such thoughts. A nosy blue stocking spinster, just the sort of female that he normally avoided as he would a bad rash. I'm sorry, like what you say? Like a bad rash? A female you would avoid like a bad rash. I am not okay with this. Like I okay. literally like could not handle myself. I was <laughs> when I was reading this book, Kelsey, you would have laughed so hard because I was like in my house, like, oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> like getting up and like could not handle. Now I'm gonna read a longer passage here. Okay. And at the end, I'm going to highlight some of the words in this passage because I felt like all of these, this passage in particular, had such terrible adjectives that I feel like people reading this who maybe do identify with Sarah. I mean, it seems like you came out in a good place at the end of it, but I would be worried that women reading this book would come out of this book feeling worse about themselves. So here we go. His gaze shifted to her hair. He studied the strands for several long seconds, then frowned, and she barely refrained from clapping her arms over her head to thwart his unimpeded view. Finally, he said, I thought your hair was brown, but here in the sunlight, it's more, um, colorful. It looks curly. Based on his scowl, it was clear his words weren't a compliment. Even as she inwardly cringed, she had to press her lips together to keep from telling him that she already knew her hair was a disaster of spirals in an unfortunate hodgepodge of every shade of brown, thank you very much. It was therefore unnecessary for him to point out the flaw. Horrendously curly, she said with a philosophical shrug. One unbound, it resembles a mop. I fight with it on a daily basis, but sadly, it always wins. Does your mother have curly hair? No, my mother is beautiful. Carolyn looks just like her. Anxious to change the subject, 
she decided to put him to the test. And then she does. They never revisit it. This is a terrible, self-deprecating passage, and he makes zero comment. He does not say, don't be so hard on yourself. He says nothing. They never go back to it. So I'm going to read the words that, in my opinion, are very negative connotation words. I, I highlighted them here in my thing in red. For okay. this. So strands, right? Mm -hmm. Strands of hair. Frowned. Thwart. Scowl. Cringed. Disaster. Unfortunate. Hodgepodge. Flaw. Horrendously. Fight. Anxious. To me, that's just not okay. The fact that there was not anything good about it afterwards. Like, I was not okay. Okay. I get what you're saying. And I mean, when you break it down like that, it does sound really bad. And I think that for me, I just, I guess the reason I wasn't so as upset by you is because I was just understanding this as internal dialogue. Does that make sense? And like, yes, it's a bad self-deprecating internal dialogue and I don't agree with it. And I think that's why for me though. But that was out loud, Kelsey. She said no, those things out like, loud. No, she said that's horrendously curly. When it unbounded like, resembles a but mop. Also too, she's just. You're right, but she's also just, as a character, she's just convinced everything negative. Like, she's convinced everything's negative. Yeah, and to me, that's classic, like, depression, right? Like, she is putting on a facade for those around her, but she isn't happy inside. And she never she never gets to be that happy inside. She's happy that she has someone who she loves. But I, to me, the reason the, the book is a, an offender is because things like that, women reading things like that, that's not good for us. Like, we don't need to hear that without something positive, right? It's I I think it's good to read things like this and see a transformation, but there just wasn't one. There wasn't a transformation. There wasn't. No, and I agree there wasn't a there wasn't a transformation that was needed. And I 100% agree with that. Like she did need to finally convince herself, like she did need to have a bit more of an internal idea that she was worthy and was willing and it that's why for me that was just such an incongruous thing with her actions because she would have that's these depression. actions that's that was depression like, yeah. to me right like that you you outwardly put on this other thing and inwardly you're just killing yourself or it's body dysmorphic disorder or it's borderline personality disorder like i, I mean and those things are okay to have like i'm not trying to say like that 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 I don't like her because she maybe has an actual mental instability or mental No, but hurdle. you dislike that you there wasn't there was the lift up. There wasn't the support at the end for that personal thing. No. And I think like, you know, I know a lot of people. I have a, a lot of personal connections with those things. And so when I see it, I'm just like, I want to see something empowering. For example, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Have you watched that? I don't I don't remember. I think it's all like an episode. Okay. So a small spoiler alert here for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. So skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't want to hear this. But in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, the main character and the, eventually comes to terms with the fact that she does have a mental health problem and she does eventually tackle it. And in my opinion, that kind of arc, like she does get – really dark and really down and goes through a thing. But at the end of it, it's really uplifting. And they have all this kind of powerful songs about getting a diagnosis or another song called antidepressants are not such a big deal. You know, those are the kind of things that I think we need to promote, right? That we need to say that, that there's something good in the dark. And I just, I just feel like Sarah had a strong streak of self-flagellation mixed with a heavy dose of body dysmorphia. And I You're felt right. like and it was he, the author. Like, yeah, and he portraying. didn't really. And to be fair, she did kind of need Matthew to be there. She did. And like the whole idea of you being empowered is the idea that you don't need a man to make you feel happy. I literally wrote at the end of the book with that quote about like, don't worry, sweetheart. I can think of enough reasons for both of us. I put in all caps. I'm so mad. I left this book so mad because I... I was waiting for it to redeem itself, and it didn't. So this, in my opinion, is our first offender. I can't believe he said avoid her like a bad rash, the kind of woman he would avoid normally like a bad rash. I mean, oh, oh man, Zoe, if you want to talk about a real defender, I have one in my back pocket that is like one of the worst books I've ever read, and it is like, it's an older one. Ooh. It was like written in like the 80s, so Ooh. it is like, and maybe that's because I've, read, I've read that book. So for me, like, I was like, well, there's things I don't like. And there's definitely things that I don't think need to be there through the whole thing. But I'm like, it's not that bad because in actuality, she, like, has opinions and he takes them into account. And I've read this one book and it is truly atrocious. Well, that And I think like maybe fun. for me, that's, like, that's the offender one. Gotcha. And, like, if it doesn't touch that one, then I'm like, it's not so bad. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you should think this is bad. Normally, I don't. I don't try to say, like... 
you should think the way I think, but it's bad. It's bad. So I don't know. I don't know if I've convinced you. Regardless, I think Zoe will not recommend this book to anyone. No, (laughs) I do not recommend it. And in fact, I would rate it. This is hard because I was like, I obviously hate this book, right? So I wanted to rate it something very low. But I was like, well, what makes a one? Like, I don't have a definition of what makes a one. I feel like I have definitions of what makes a five through 10. But below that, I wasn't sure. I think I rated the, since the surrender, a three or something. Like, I hated Mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. But like, this book is in another echelon. Like, this to me is so different. Like, I feel badly that I gave that book such a low rating now that I've read this one. Like, Mm -hmm. I – so I feel like I – if I gave that one a three or a four, which I think I did, I've got to give this book a one because I would – I would not have finished it for this podcast. The negative attitude that the character has, I am not interested in reading more of this author's work. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will, but we've already decided we are not going to be starting the second book, but we'll get to that later, what we're reading next time. It's okay, because in all honesty, I don't have the best memories of the second book. (laughs) I read the second book, and there was, like, parts I liked about it, and I think I just was, like, interested in the genre, and I was, like, just starting to consume them. And I love – But I did remember – like, this one, I had fond memories of. The second book, I had major dislikes in it. Interesting. And see, I think it's really cool. So uh, I'm going to give a little fact about you, but you and your friends have a book club that you guys named the Ladies Literary Society, I don't know, of London? No, we're not of London. We're just the Ladies Literary Society. Because of these books. And I think that that's wonderful. And I love, I want all the Ladies Literary Societies, all of them. I want them all to happen. But I think that's why for me, this book was, I'm going to say like a 7.5. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no, it's higher for me. But it's like I said, while I disliked her constant tearing of herself down, like I wasn't having the same visceral reaction you were. Visceral. And I just <laughs> and but I think maybe it's because like I read it and I had such fond memories of it, but I did remember it. Light and fluffy, light and fluffy, light and fluffy. It wasn't complicated. It was just airy and nice. And so for me, I am not against recommending it, but I also will say I couldn't remember the name of this book. I had to actually ask a friend (laughs) who recommended it to me what the name of the book was because I could not remember it for the life. Well, I think that's pretty cool. It sounds like both of us maybe got what we needed out of this book. Like you had a nice fun read after a hard week and I got to complain about shit. Yeah. (laughs) That's what we needed. I know. So like we sort of mentioned, next week we're going to be moving on to something else because, well, we've caught the fever. We have caught the fever, and it is by the name of Bridgertons. Hell yeah. We can't help it. There's so much Bridgerton stuff going around right now. Like, we have to read The Duke and I. We have to revisit them. I remember The Bridgerton so fondly. That was my first, like, major series that I read. I think I read this series, maybe, like, a couple other books, and then I read The Bridgertons. Oh, yeah. And this is your Desert Island set. Yes. So it's going to be So hopefully it plays up because, like I said, I don't really reread books very often. It's not my thing. I don't do it. So I have not really reread these books, but I have very fond memories of them, and I have very vivid memories of them. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, we'll get into it as we get into the series because some of them I absolutely, absolutely love. And not only are there epilogues in these books, there are second epilogues. Oh, yeah. Epilogues. Julia Quinn came back and she's like, you know what? I got to give them some more story because I'm not done with him yet. And we're not done with him yet because now Netflix is doing a series. Yes, Netflix is. And also, too... If you're not quite sure about the Bridgertons yet, she also has been releasing books now, which are Bridgerton prequels. (laughs) Yeah, the other Miss Bridgerton. But you still follow the family. And here's the thing. I'm well, gonna, you I'm gonna give a little backstory. I'm gonna give a little kind of inside the podcast studio moment here because Basically, our plan with this podcast, and we sort of mentioned this before, was to read a series through to its entirety and then talk about the series as a whole. And we're going to get there with Penny Royal. It's going to happen. We're going to read all of them. But it's going to be kind of interspersed with other things. And so we were thinking, oh, well, maybe we do one long series and a couple of short ones. But now it's all over the place. But we're definitely – our our first most important thing that we've decided is we want to get through all, the eight main Bridgerton books – before the series airs so that if you guys don't want to read them yourselves, you can get a good recap with us. Sometimes I almost feel like reading it. I like, I didn't reread the Harry Potter books before I saw the Harry Potter movies because I was like, oh my God, then I'm going to remember too much and I'm going to be upset about the details. Yes. But I am so excited about them and I'm excited about seeing the characters come to life and we just have to reread them. And what I do want to say though, is if you've never read the Bridgertons, you should do it. And, like, you've got to get through at least the first 
four books before the series comes out would be my recommendation. If this is yeah. reading, because the fourth book is Colin and Penelope, maybe? Maybe. So the first yeah. is Simon and Daphne. The second then is Anthony. Anthony and Kate. And then Benedict and Cynthia. How can I remember all these names? And then, I have no idea. I can't even remember titles, Zoe. Then I think Colin and Penelope. <laughs> and then there's Francesca, and I don't remember her thing. That's five. Who am I forgetting? Then there's Hyacinth uh, and Gregory. Eloise. Eloise. Oh, Eloise is somewhere in the first five. So I don't know. I think Eloise has Maybe the, the book first and then Francesca. I think, I think it's, twins. yeah, I think Eloise is five. I think Colin and Penelope are four. Regardless, Colin and Penelope's book, we're going on too long. You got to at least read to that because there's some very exciting plot points that, in my opinion, are much more fun to read when you get all the way through to that book versus absolutely hearing us talk about it. But if hearing us talk about it is your jam, we're super pumped for that too. And on that note, we have talked for a very long time today. But what can we say? We're in the same room. <laughs> I know, right? We're just kind of enjoying the banter back and forth. It's a little bit easier when you're not talking to a computer. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we are excited for next week. Like we said, Bridgerton's fever in full swing. We're reading The Duke and I about Simon and Daphne. So join us next time. And thanks for listening. Thanks so much. We'll see you then. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Bye. Well, uh, that is a weird uh, introduction, and it's weird to see you on the other side of me. <laughs> um, but no, I'll try it again. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about how I struggle with, as a feminist, ripping apart someone else's work. Daisy, you can't go under the table. <laughs> You're like pulling on the cords, Daisy. Daisy? You really, really Come need to go over here, please. Right. Come over here. There, now she has room. Okay. Okay. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, being a feminist and also giving your opinion, maybe an unfavorable opinion about someone else's work. Uh... <laughs> Dog background noise. Yeah. Daisy, lay down. Okay. This is why you're not allowed in the room with me. <laughs> All right, quick pause. Yeah, let's do it. Unpause. All right. Thank you for joining us in the parlor today. That sounded terrible. What do we say when we enter the parlor? We always say all right. So I thought we don't actually need to because there's music. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? So you can be like, today we have another book recommendation okay. or whatever, however you mm -hmm. want to start. Today we have a lovely recommendation from our listeners.